Hello, Pensado's Place. My name is Eric Valentine. Welcome to my little recording studio lair. This is uh, Barefoot Recording. Uh, I moved in here in 2000. I've been here for about uh, almost 11 years now. And uh, it's been a great spot. Um, mostly left it the same as it was. It was a, a great studio um, that was built back in the 60s uh, called Crystal Studios. And um, the sound room is very similar to what it was back then. Um, I've, I've added a couple little things. I'm going to kind of walk around a little bit and show you guys uh, some of the stuff um, I've talked about here and there on some forums and uh, a couple of magazines and stuff and uh, so people can actually see them and see how they work and stuff. Um, so first, let's check out this robot. People always ask me about the microphone robot. Um, I built this thing about three or four years ago um, after just uh, endless complaints from assi assistants being tortured out in the sound room in front of five million decibel uh, guitar amps. Um, I finally put this thing together so I could put them out of their misery and uh, make it a lot easier for myself to uh, position microphones. So I'm able to sit in, uh, in the control room um, with controls that are mounted into the console itself and uh, move around the, uh, the microphone and be able to see the position. We have a little video camera on there. You can see on the monitor screen up there um, what I see in the control room. And um, so I can sit in there and just nudge it around tiny little bits at a time, um, all three directions. So it'll go left, right, up and down, in and out um, from the... Uh, from the guitar cab, and um, I'll never record guitar without it ever again. Uh, at this point, I mean, I, I mostly try to just um, EQ the guitar with the mic position. Instead of having to reach, reach for an EQ, I can just play with the position and make it brighter or warmer or whatever um, just by the position of the mic and not have to be, you know, wrenching on EQs to, uh, to get, get the guitar sound. So it gets me a lot closer when I can uh, tweak it sitting in front of my little NS10s. So then the other thing that... Um, I put in here was uh, what we call the drumbrella. Um, I built this, th this thing maybe two, two or three years ago. And uh, I got to give credit where it's due. Uh, this is a, just a straight up ripoff <laughs> of the one that they have at Oceanway Studio B. Uh, a friend of mine was recording over there and uh, was actually using it. And when I came by to visit him and say hi, he said, you got to come out and check this thing out. I sat down at the drum kit, played a little bit while he moved it up and down, and I, I knew instantly, within five seconds, I have to have this. It is the coolest thing ever. And so basically what it does is it makes it so you can adjust the resonance of the room to accommodate the tuning of the drums. I really like to tune the drums to the key of the song that's being played. And so I can tweak the snare drum so the overtones are sort of ringing in key with the song. And I used to have this issue where, um, you know, I would get it where the snare drum was in key, but it sounded kind of thin just because it wasn't reacting with the room right. And with this thing, once I have it in key with the song, I can adjust the height of this so it interacts with the drum and makes it sound really full. And so, you know, I'll sit down once I have the tuning of the drum. find the spot where the drum sounds, sounds really fat, and uh, it works great. It, we use it all the time. So, drumbrella. Then, uh, you know, this place has just got tons of stuff, lots of instruments, mics, and amps and stuff for, for bands to play with when they come in here. It's just, it's a really cool part of um, the process for bands when they come here to be able to just dig around out here and discover an instrument or a guitar pedal or an amp or something that you know sparks an idea or inspires something for them to you know have something new to try on a song or take things in a new direction so you know this is just a big like you know it's like a big thrift shop for for recording gear people just you know rummage around out here here's your there's your marxophone that was used on the all-american rejects record it was on uh... The, the song on there that that was a duet. We've got an auto harp. This thing was used on uh, 
Third Eye Blinds, How's It Gonna Be, a long time ago. Uh, set of vibes right here. You gotta love the vibes. Um, pedal steel normally doesn't doesn't get used on rock records, but uh, that thing was used uh, a ton on uh, the, a record I did a long time ago. A band I used to play in this band called T Ride, and uh, we used that uh, pedal steel all over that record. Um, so yeah, tons of drums. Here's uh, uh, my red Vista Light kick drum. Uh, let's see, there's one particular snare drum that's been kicking around for a long time. So this is my bell brass snare. This gets used a ton. Um, this was all over the Queens of the Stone Age record. It was, um, man, it's, a, it's on everything. It's just a great, great sounding drum. This is a kind of a crappy old um, pearl uh, export drum uh, that I bought. It just came with uh, a drum kit that I bought because it had a super huge kick drum that I wanted and it had a drum head on it that sounded great and I left it like that for a long time and uh, this drum was on a lot of songs and, and the drum head lasted a long time. It was on, uh, this was the snare drum on Semi Charm Life and uh, it was also the snare drum on Queens of the Stone Age um, Go With The Flow. Um, ultimately Dave Grohl killed that head <laughs> in those sessions and that was the end of its run. It's never really sounded quite the same since then. Um, lots of percussion. We can look at a bunch of mics over here too. C37As, um, an old CMV3. This was used as sort of like the center drum kit mic on the Queens of the Stone Age stuff. 441s, it's a cool guitar mic, cool vocal mic. Um, there's my SM7s. I use those all the time on vocals. Um, at one point, I got really into D20s, and so I just started buying them anytime they popped up. So I have a whole whole collection of these things. They all sound different. They're all numbered, so I can keep track of which ones I'm using, which ones I like better than others, which ones match better. Um, so I keep track of all of that. Um, this thing... This is uh, an AKG D202, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but this microphone ended up inspiring the solution that we came up with for getting rid of the, the reflections off of the console. That's, that windscreen is made out of this weird porous metal, and when we were trying to figure out how the hell we were going to get the surface of the console to not be reflective, um, I had this microphone set up. And I think it was Larry that's, that noticed it and was like, this, this could probably work. And uh, so that actually became the solution for that. A short body uh, 47 tube mic. Uh, bought this mic probably back in 1990 for 1200 bucks. Um, it was in the era when uh, the band I was in, T-Ride, had got signed to a record deal and we convinced the label to let us use the budget to buy equipment and we bought that microphone. Um, instead of spending the money in somebody else's studio. Um, this thing, that's um, an RCA KU3A, or some people, it's also called a 10001. Great sound, amazing sounding ribbon mic. Um, really cool on all kinds of instruments. Instantly vintage sounding. These uh, um, C12As, been around for a long time. I found these in a in a pawn shop in San Francisco, Eagle Pawn in San Francisco, and built connectors for them and had Bill Bradley build me a power supply. They sound great. Been using them ever since for, you know, 20 years. RCA 44. Um, there's my Coles. Love these. Use them on everything. Um, lots of what I call Bobo mics. Um, just weird lo-fi stuff. That's an old Veracoustic. Um, the uh, wonderfully satanic EV666. Um, this, is a, this is a more recent one, the 655. This is a really cool sounding mic. Um, this is a great drum mic. Um, the D22. Um, yeah, it just goes on and on. There's all kinds of 
just stupid, stupid stuff that sounds weird put on things. So, uh, the, you know, the, the way I usually set stuff up is um, I like to keep the mic pre's out in the sound room, close to the, to the instruments. I like running nice short mic cable runs, go into the mic pre's, and then have the long run be line level from the mic pre into the control room. Um, so I, I keep a bunch of mic pre's out here. There's a bunch of, you know, reissue sort of Neve 1081 type things and some Langevin's. Um, there's, uh, there's a bunch of custom tube mic pre's down there. So, so I usually have the mic pre set up here. They go through tie lines. Um, musicians listen on a, an Aviom headphone system so they can just balance their own stuff and I don't have to worry about doing headphone levels. Um, right now there's actually, this is the prototype version of the undertone audio mic pre right there. Um, I've been using that thing on pretty much everything so I can just figure out, um, finalize any sort of component changes and tweak it and make sure it's really sounding the way we want. Um, so I've been recording it on everything, trying different transformers, trying all kinds of different stuff. So once we, uh, get in here, the, the mic pre's come in through tie lines and then they just show up on uh, inputs on the console. Um, so then I have a phase, phase reverse control on the channel strip of the console. I can adjust phase and stuff in here while I'm listening. And then I also have a line trim on the, the inputs of the console channel strip so I can add or take away, you know, 10 dB of gain on, uh, on the signal coming from the mic pre. So I can sort of fine tune the, the levels of those. Um, I can do any EQing and stuff that I, that I want to do before things go to tape or to the computer. And uh, so then, you know, what I'm playing around with right now is uh, a recording that's trying to recreate like an old Motown sound. And uh, so um, I'm recording each instrument sort of one at a time, overdubbing everything. And so everything goes through this old uh, Studer J37. It's an old uh, 60s all tube um, one inch four track. And um, I just, I set it up at seven and a half ips, really, really slow tape speed, very crunchy sounding. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really cool sound. Uh, so then uh, in this case, so I go tape machine first and then go into the computer, capture the sound of the uh, tape machine into the computer. And um, then I can just monitor things back over here on the console and uh, do all my final EQ uh, adjustments and stuff on, on playback.